Imagine you're the CEO of a large Japanese bank with hundreds of billions of dollars under management. Your bank has been a leading voice within the Japanese financial space for decades, but the future doesn't look so bright. The bank has been stagnating for years, and it's just a matter of time until profits start to decline. So you go ahead and invest into every hype tech company you can think of. DoorDash, Uber, Lemonade, SoFi, Supercell, TikTok, Tesla, Netflix, basically everything. For a couple of years, you ride up the momentum of these growth stocks and your bank starts to return to its former glory. But then, one of your risky investments, WeWork, jumps off a cliff and you end up losing $8.9 billion. To make things worse, the pandemic rolls around and it looks like all your risky investments are about to get obliterated. A normal investor would probably just not look at their portfolio until the storm's over. But you're not a normal investor, you're a giant bank. So, you try to buy your way out of the situation and pour gas on every stock you own. And in just one year, you go from posting your biggest loss in 14 years to posting the biggest profit in Japanese history. In fact, you make so much profit that you become the sixth most profitable company in the world pulling in $56.46 billion. The second highest bank on the list is Goldman Sachs and they only pulled in roughly one third of your profit. So here's how SoftBank bought themselves out of the pandemic. Taking a look back, the entire story of SoftBank circles back to one man named Masayoshi Son. Masayoshi was born on August 11th, 1967 in Kyushu, Japan. Growing up, Masayoshi had a pretty modest childhood. In fact, it wouldn't be a stretch to say that he was poor. His grandfather had made a living as a miner and his father was making a living selling fish and pigs. Some reports even suggest that Masayoshi slept with the pigs when he was young. So clearly, Masayoshi didn't have it easy by any means, and this motivated him to work extremely hard and hustle as much as possible. When he was 16 for example, Masayoshi looked up to a man named Den Fujita who was the president of McDonald's Japan. Den apparently had a best-selling book that blew away Masayoshi, and Masayoshi was trying to meet Den ever since. Masayoshi started off by repeatedly calling his assistants in an effort to get a meeting. He says that he called Den's assistants 60 times over many months, and every time they told him that they would ask Den, but they never got back to him. So one day, Masayoshi decided to go to McDonald's headquarters in Tokyo and ask an assistant in person. And sure enough, Den would agree to meet Masayoshi right then and there for 15 minutes. Den told Masayoshi that if he was 16, he would go to America to get his education and then do something related to computers. Hearing this from his idol, Masayoshi would instantly make the move. He contacted some relatives who lived in South San Francisco and arranged to move in with them. In San Francisco, Masayoshi attended Saramont High School, but Masayoshi had no intention of sticking around. Masayoshi felt that he already knew everything in the textbook and that he didn't need to go to class. So he petitioned to just take all his final exams and get his high school diploma. Just three weeks later, Masayoshi aced all his exams and graduated high school. Masayoshi would go on to attend UC Berkeley where he majored in economics. In college though, academics was no longer his primary focus. Following Den's advice, Masayoshi attempted to create something in the computer space. He committed to coming up with one new idea per day so that he could iterate through a bunch of ideas and pick the best one. After several months and over 250 ideas later, Masayoshi settled on creating a translation device that could translate between Japanese, English, and German. He would end up selling this technology to Sharp for $450,000 in 1978. But despite making a substantial amount of cash, Masayoshi didn't drop out of college. He eventually finished up his economics degree in 1980 and returned to Japan. Now that he had money though, instead of getting a job, Masayoshi started SoftBank in September of 1981. Despite the name SoftBank, the company actually had nothing to do with the banking or the financial industry. The company was originally a software distribution company and Masayoshi felt that it was a bank for software, hence the name. SoftBank was the first PC software distributor in Japan which gave them a decent advantage, but given the small nature of the software market at the time, SoftBank needed other sources of revenue. So Masayoshi expanded the company into the magazine space in 1982. SoftBank came out with two monthly magazines called OPC and OMZ. These magazines covered the manufacturing and engineering sides of PCs as opposed to the consumer side which was much more common. This unique coverage made these magazines extremely popular, and it didn't take long for SoftBank to become the largest PC magazine publisher in Japan. In the meantime, SoftBank accidentally became more and more of an investment advisor. Given that SoftBank was publishing magazines that covered the latest developments on the engineering and manufacturing side of PCs, investors often based their investments on these magazines. Masayoshi decided to lean into this and target American investors as well. 
In March of 1994, SoftBank expanded to the US, where they specialized in identifying internet-related investment opportunities. Just a few months later, SoftBank would go half public through the OTC markets and end up raising 20 billion yen, or roughly $175 million. SoftBank could use this cash to make their own investments as opposed to just recommending investments. And with that, SoftBank took their first steps into becoming an actual bank. Around the same time, growth shifted away from PC companies and into internet companies. Masayoshi was well aware of this trend and was determined to capitalize on it. In late 1995, he made an investment into Yahoo, and over the next year, he would work with Yahoo to launch Yahoo in Japan. Two years later, SoftBank would go fully public by debuting on the Tokyo Stock Exchange. Following the IPO, SoftBank quickly became a pure holding company, and they would make several investments into internet companies. But by far their biggest investment of all time came in 2000 when they invested $20 million into Alibaba. Ironically, they bought in at the peak of the dot-com bubble, but despite that, their $20 million investment has turned into, wait for it, $110 billion. And that's after the 50% crash Alibaba experienced over the past year. Alibaba has grown so large that it accounts for 47% of SoftBank's entire assets. So this was no doubt a massive win for SoftBank, but as the dot-com bubble came to a close, Masayoshi adopted a more conservative investing style, which led him to the telecommunications industry. In July of 2004, they acquired Japan Telecom Company, which got them into the fixed-line telecommunications business. Two years later, they bought Vodafone, which got them into the mobile communications business. And in 2008, they worked with Apple to be the exclusive provider of the iPhone 3G in Japan. All these endeavors allowed SoftBank to grow through the early 2000s, but the rate of growth was nowhere near the 1980s and 90s. Despite this, Masayoshi continued with this more conservative style into the 2010s. In July of 2013, SoftBank acquired 70% of Sprint, and they held on to this purchase up until last year when they sold it to T-Mobile. In the meantime, SoftBank's revenue and profit went from slow growth to no growth. Some years were better, and some years were worse. But for the most part, SoftBank profited between $4 and $8 billion for 5 years straight between 2012 and 2017. Masayoshi knew that something had to be done, so he started something called the Vision Fund in 2017. Masayoshi looked back at what made SoftBank successful in the first place, and the answer was clear, outsized bets in emerging industries. The bulk of SoftBank's exponential growth came from PCs, software, and the internet. So Masayoshi decided to return to the roots of the company with the Vision Fund. He put $100 billion into the Vision Fund and focused on investing into all of the up-and-coming tech companies, including NVIDIA, Flipkart, ARM, GM, Slack, OneWeb, all the companies we mentioned at the beginning, and much, much more. Over the next few years, SoftBank's profits grew to $10 to $20 billion per year. But then, as we discussed at the beginning, WeWork happened. SoftBank quickly racked up billions of dollars worth of losses in the first quarter of 2020, and we all know what came about in March of 2020. Losses quickly compounded on each other and it didn't take long for SoftBank to be in the worst position they've ever been in. But luckily for SoftBank, they had an ace up their sleeve which was options trading. In summer of 2020, SoftBank went out and bought $4 billion worth of options in Amazon, Netflix, Tesla, Microsoft, Alphabet, and 19 of the other biggest tech companies in the world. $4 billion alone would be enough to move these stocks a couple of percent, but since it was options, their $4 billion purchase actually translated to $50 billion worth of stock. I don't think I need to explain how powerful this is. SoftBank was one of the leading factors behind the tech rally in summer of 2020, when the entire Nasdaq rallied nearly 30% in 3 months. To put that in perspective, the market generally only grows 8% per year. SoftBank exited their options positions at the end of 2020, but not before locking in tens of billions of dollars worth of profits. When it was revealed that SoftBank was a whale behind these massive purchases, investors in the SEC were not happy. The SEC launched an investigation into SoftBank, but we don't have a decision yet. In all likelihood though, the SEC is unlikely to do anything to SoftBank because they probably didn't break any laws. Here's the thing, it's not illegal to buy $4 billion worth of options. Now, if the SEC is able to dig up some sort of insider trading evidence or evidence of a pump and dump, then they could find SoftBank. But if all SoftBank did was buy a crap load of options, it's not illegal and the SEC can't do anything about it. Even if the SEC did somehow find SoftBank for hundreds of millions or even a few billion, it would be nothing in comparison to the 50 billion they made. So there's no doubt that SoftBank came out on top financially. Morally, however, it's complicated. Do you guys think SoftBank should be punished? Comment that down below. Also, drop a like if you think that big money has way too much power.
And of course, consider joining our Discord community to suggest future video ideas, and consider subscribing to see more questions logically answered. But until then, I'm Hari, and I'll see you guys on the next one.